My name is David F. Leak, and I'm in Memphis, Tennessee today. Today is September the 11th, 2008, and I'm here to interview Attorney R. Lee Winchester of the Memphis Bar Association. This interview is being conducted for the Legal History Project of the Tennessee Bar Foundation. Mr. Winchester, uh, it's good to be with you today. Uh, I would like for you to uh, tell us your full name and your date of birth, please, sir. Well, even that kind of leads into a little bit of a story, David. I, I was born so long ago that the physicians didn't really pay a lot of attention to birth certificates. They were just coming into vogue, and uh, my mother's attending physician thought that birth certificates were a bunch of trash, mm -hmm. that if people couldn't look and see the baby, then they didn't need to know it was in existence anyway. So uh, Daddy, whose name uh, was Cassius Lee Winchester, uh, was not going to put that tag on his child. And my mother, knowing that I was going to be the last of the children uh, knew that I was going to be junior. So mother and daddy, were, I understand, were in an argument in the, in the delivery room about that issue. And, and uh, old Dr. Haywood came in and said, well, there's no need to argue about that. He said, uh, nobody gives a damn about it anyway, <laughs> and, except you all. And, and uh, uh, Lee, you say you don't want to name him Cassius Lee. Well, you want to name him. I said, well, I want to name him Richard Henry Lee Winchester uh, for, the, for his seventh or eighth great-grandfather, Richard Henry Lee, signed the Declaration of Independence. And, and Mother said, well, uh, I'm sorry that it's my baby, and he's going to be junior. So old Dr. Haywood said, no problem. So my birth certificate actually reads that I'm uh, Richard Henry Lee Winchester, Jr., spelled out, son of Cassius Lee Winchester. And it didn't create much of a problem until the, the, the next lawyer in the family came along and, and I understood where my mama was coming from, and I wanted him to be junior. So he's Richard Henry Lee Winchester, Jr., practicing attorney son of Richard Henry Lee Winchester, Jr. Yes, so I don't know how many times we're going to get away with, uh, with uh, that uh, uh, beginning. But anyway, that's, that's the... the story of how I was was named. What, uh, what day did all this I occur? I was all in, in Memphis mm -hmm. and uh, on May 21st of uh, 1924. Okay. I've and, always uh, known you as R. Lee Winchester. And, uh, that's uh, the Richard to distinguish me from the C. Lee. And your dad was known as C. Lee Winchester? He was, that's the way he signed his his name. Now, and I think that was probably at his insistence because he was the one that had all the credit at that time and I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to talk a little bit about your uh, forefathers because I think it's real interesting. You mentioned about uh, that uh, one of your forefathers signed the Declaration of Independence. Uh, does that have anything to do with the name Lee particularly? Uh, yes. Uh, that's from my uh, grandmother's uh, side rather than my grandfather's side on the Winchester lineage. Uh, my grandmother was uh, Eliza Atkinson Lee and uh, although she was one generation younger than the general, she was a first cousin of his. Of Robert E. Lee? Of Robert E. And uh, 
and uh, she and uh, my grandfather, who became the Bishop of Arkansas and who uh, was also the minister at Calvary Episcopal Church in Memphis. What year was that, Lee? The turn of the century, David. I'm not uh, exactly sure, but anyway, he, he was elected Bishop of the Diocese of Arkansas, leaving Calvary. Mm -hmm. Church, and I think it was probably don't want to get into it too deeply because don't want to use <laughs> names of people involved particularly. But I think it was uh, that some of the people at Calvary were happy that he got elected to be the <laughs> the, the bishop because uh, my grandfather felt very deeply, even at that turn of the century about uh, uh, equality of opportunity in education and, and uh, uh, both uh, racially and, and uh, uh, sexually and everything. Well, and when it was, I... And it, that was uh, kind of an oddball situation in Memphis, Tennessee at the turn of the century. Yeah. And uh, he... Uh, opened up a, a, at Calvary a, a little deal. I think you told deal, me a soup kitchen, wasn't little it? A little soup kitchen in, 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 the, in the basement of Calvary Church where his, his picture now hangs. Uh, and, and he called it the Newsboys Club. And the little urchins and uh, the street people uh, children from that time could come there in in winter time and and uh, stay warm, sleep at night, and and uh, get food. And uh, there were some some of the more dignified members of Calvary that took an extremely dim view of their preacher using their their church facilities in that manner. So I think when he got elected to be the bishop of Arkansas, he, he uh, probably made uh, some of them pretty happy. Uh -huh. uh, Lee, I wanted to ask you uh, about the name Winchester. You talked about your mom's family. Uh, what relationship uh, is your family the to local, the General the, uh, Winchester that founded Memphis? Well, General James, I guess you would say founded Memphis. Actually, there were four uh, founders: there were, oh, Overton, uh, Severe, Jackson, and Winchester. And uh, the reason we are so familiar with it is that we wound up being just uh, one, one lineage, one, one line removed from being eligible to uh, inherit some money from the. the property here mm -hmm. in Shelby County known as Hopefield Shoot, which is the property right across the river. So my father went into great detail to try to find that. And actually our relationship is uh, once removed from that, but comes from the same general lineage in, out of southern England. Mm -hmm. and the, the, the name is from the Winchester Cathedral and, and uh, all of that. That comes from the fact that the oldest son inherited the land at that time and the younger children got land grants in the United States. And uh, our line drew uh, the property up uh, on the Severn River up in Annapolis, Maryland. Mm -hmm. So we're known as the Maryland Branch, and uh, General James, uh, the closest kin I guess we'd be to General James would be, uh, you'd have to go to an uncle okay. to get a direct uh, ad. Actually, uh, we came back to Memphis General James and all that operation was 1827 when 
the uh, uh, town was uh, in Shelby County was chartered and all that. Let me ask you a little bit about and, your, and, about and your uh, then then uh, uh, we didn't come until my grandfather was called to Calvary okay. in the ministry, and that was the turn of the century. Uh, Lee, I want to talk to you about your dad. Uh, he mm -hmm. was a prominent attorney here in Memphis for mm -hmm. a long time. Is that right? Well, I, I think so. Yeah. I, I tried to advertise him as best I could under the ethics <laughs> of the profession. At that time. Uh, uh, how long did your dad practice law here? Uh, Fifty-seven years. And uh, when he was also president of the Memphis Bar Association, is that correct? Yes, and was the first as I understand it, the first treasurer of the state bar, but a past president of the uh, uh, local bar. When they were, uh, for the treasury, there wasn't any treasury, they had to just form one. I think that's hmm. the way he was treasurer. He was, he was around as a young lawyer and had been in the legislature and so forth when the, when the they were put in the state bar. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you were the youngest uh, of your dad's family. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you tell us about your brothers and sisters? And yes, uh, my my brother Jim had quite a an illustrious uh, World War II record. He was already in the Air Force and a, an officer and a navigator in the when the Pearl Harbor came along, and he was stationed at Langley Field, Virginia. Is he the oldest? No, uh, Jim was the next to the oldest. There were four of us. Uh, my uh, oldest was my sister Margaret, who was married to a, a lawyer that uh, was fairly well known and with whom I was very close, named John High School, who served as a local attorney general for a time here and uh, practiced with high school Donaldson and, uh, uh, I mean, Canelli Glankler, I'm sorry. Yeah. Practiced uh, <laughs> against the other group yeah. uh, to some extent, but uh, he, uh, uh, John uh, went through some of his frustrations and so forth and and in the James Earl Ray case and others during, during his tenure. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that was, he was married to your sister Margaret? He was married to my sister Ma Margaret. Okay. And his, his son, incidentally, uh, was a graduate of the Naval Academy and uh, agreed to uh, 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 give up an opportunity to become an astronaut for which he he had been approved if, he, if his little wife would let him sign up and volunteer for uh, the service uh, in Vietnam. And it turned out that uh, Vietnam was much more dangerous than the astronaut. He was he was shot down and and enlisted uh, for the rest of uh, the seven year time frame of missing in action uh, to be declared deceased. And uh -huh. So that's pretty. Who was after Margaret? Margaret and then Jim. Then and Jim I, was a lawyer, correct? Uh, Jim became a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Jim uh, uh, was shot down or, 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 or crashed or, uh, three times in, in the Pacific Theater. Uh, he left uh, Langley Field uh, at 2.30 in the morning on December the 8th of 1941. Mm. Flew to the West Coast, patrolled it for submarine, for Japanese submarines for a couple of weeks, and then they gave him a map, and uh, such as the uh, navigational aids were at that time, and they landed first at Pearl Harbor while it was still still burning and mm. then went on on further and 
he flew out of a place in New Guinea called uh, Eleven Mile Field. Mm -hmm. And uh, when did he become a lawyer? After he, he got came, out of the army? Yes, he was shot down and and was uh, really a nervous wreck uh, when he first when the war was first over. And uh, the, the physicians recommended that he be in a quieter environment. Uh, but uh, Jim uh, came in and bought a farm and decided to make a cattle ranch out of it. And, and uh, we went in partners and bought two cows, but my cow died, he said. <laughs> so I, uh, but Jim and I, had grown up, slept in the same room when, when uh, Evelyn, my uh, the, the younger sister, but older sister to me, yeah. uh, came along. All well, the two girls drew, drew bedrooms, and Jim and I had to, to sleep together. So we practiced law together, and we, we slept together, and we we. Uh, uh, we loved each other dearly and respected and admired. Jim was the lawyer in in the family that mother and daddy had. He was he was a great great practitioner. Was he a trial lawyer? Uh, was a trial lawyer and and uh, when he was 43 years old in November of 1963, I guess it was. Jim. Uh, had a heart attack uh, trying a jury case in uh, Division Three of Circuit Court. Here in Shelby and, County? And died here on the council table. Mm. And uh, I was serving as county attorney at that time, and the county attorney's office was in the, on the floor directly under Andy Holmes' court. They came and got me in. I tried unsuccessfully to to breathe uh, mm. uh, life into him, but he was already gone. Mm. But Jim was, a, you say, was he a trial lawyer? He was a trial lawyer's trial lawyer. He was something else. That's great. Uh, Lee, uh, you mentioned uh, Martha, Margaret. My sister Margaret, Margaret, yeah. and then uh, James, and then you said that you had another sister, is that right? Evelyn. Eva. Evelyn. Oh, Evelyn. E yes, okay. Evelyn Bird. Okay. And that's uh, part of the the Bird family, the Admiral Bird, and all that. Did all you that uh, bunch of my brother Jim had an opportunity through that relationship that got vetoed by my mother, who was urged upon the family by my father to make one of the Arctic trips of. Uh, with, with Admiral back when Jim was, Jim was an Eagle Scout and and uh, they promoted him up to where he had an opportunity but it it, it fell apart over my mother's <laughs> wanting to try to keep us all alive. I understand. I uh, want to get into your childhood a little bit. Uh, you uh, went to grammar school at where? I was uh, uh, you, you know, we have tigers and lions and all of the other school names and everything. Uh, I was a, uh, an attendee at, at uh, Pentecost Garrison Powder Puffs uh, <laughs> School for Boys. Was that really their, their nickname, that, Powder Puffs? That was our nickname, and it was sort of like, like uh, a boy named Sue. <laughs> it's kind of tough. <laughs> that may have tough. explained a lot of things about how, how uh, tough you are. <laughs> well, uh, we, uh, I, I've been pretty fortunate in that I uh, was not a good football player, and I was little. So I was kind of like when John Ward got excited about uh, uh, the t UT team one time and he said, I'll say one thing about those balls. They, they may be 
little, but they're slow. <laughs> and I, so I had all of the attributes, although I was, I was kind of fast. I ran track in, in school, but I tried to play football, but each time I would manage to get strategically hurt so that I couldn't really <laughs> have to show the, and disclose to everybody the fact really how inept a football uh, player I was. And I had my share of accolades from, from uh, some studies and military activities at uh, Culver, where I attended uh, after Pentecost, was a military school. I was there on scholarship. And, and, uh, and that took you all the way till you graduated from high school? or Yes. I guess it wasn't high school at then, it was... Uh, uh, Pentecost, Pentecost went through the ninth grade, went, uh -huh. through, went through junior high. Yeah. And of course I, I attended Pentecost Garrison with a lot of uh, people that we could, each, each of whom we could uh, talk about. I, I, we played horse and rider at, at a little recess and, and uh, Billy Loeb, who was Henry's, uh, our, our city mayor's, uh, Kid brother uh, Billy was uh, was the horse, and I was the rider at little recess. And we we were the champion horse, horse and, and rider, horse and rider now, players at Pentecost. And I broke my arm on the football squad. It wasn't a very big squad. <laughs> we we had a, a, a one of the teachers that had agreed to to uh, take uh, Miss Beatrice Garrison's place as our coach. Miss, Miss B was an old maid teaching one of the owners of the school. And then turned out when the, uh, we, we got a male coach, it turned out that he liked girls. So we, <laughs> we, we had to live down an awful lot of things and and uh, don't want to get too wrapped up in that because there's so many right. uh, so, so many of the members of the uh, uh, foundation and fellows of the bar also attended Pentecost and they might uh, not appreciate my telling some of the <laughs> some of the stories about Pentecost but I my, my father had been to Culver Military Academy, and my brother Jim had been. This my is a boarding Jim, school? It's a boarding school in Indiana. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Jim had been the, the senior cadet captain and regimental commander. And my daddy had been uh, to Culver on scholarship because when he was the minister at, at uh, Christ Church in St. Louis, a man named Culver, who uh, owned and, and operated the Culver Stove Works, which everybody used. I mean, it was a very popular iron, iron stove. And, and my grandfather went to him for a raise and uh, used a need to educate my father as an excuse and he said well that's no excuse that he just now got a scholarship to Culver military <laughs> they started a great tradition i'm and sure I, I, I was on that uh, then after you got out of culver did you go on to uh, college directly from there uh i was uh in my last year at culver when uh, uh, Pearl Harbor happened. And uh, uh, my father wanted me to get as much uh, education as was humanly possible uh, before I had to go into service. So, uh, and because I was through the ROTC program at Culver, uh, I was already uh, theoretically at least qualified to be a second uh, lieutenant with just uh, a summer camp. And uh, 
So he had me uh, uh, drop out and, and, and start at the University of Tennessee early. I already had more than enough college credits, I mean, uh, uh, high school credits to graduate. Did and, you? Uh, so I, I went then to UT Knoxville. And how long were you at UT before you went in the military? Went in September of 72. 72 or 42? I mean, goodness <laughs> gracious. No, I'm sorry, 42. Uh, and uh, and all of the advanced ROTC students from uh, the University of Tennessee uh, went into actual active, active duty on April the 6th of 1943. We all caught the Chattanooga Choo Choo and went down. Uh, and all of the cute little girls and everybody were down at the railroad station <laughs> see us off. And it was a, a mass migration of UT students uh, uh, going into active duty. But I actually signed up and started wearing uniform and that kind of business and, and training and forming squads and doing all those things uh, in, in school and intensifying our, our military training. Uh, we signed uh, up and, and were actually soldiers uh, after November the 2nd of you told me uh, when we were talking before that you uh, ended up down in Louisiana, is that correct? <laughs> yes, a typical military story there. Uh, Camp Claiborne, Louisiana, well, the swamps were pretty, pretty tough. Uh, you could uh, kind of take a choice. You could either choke to death on the dust or drown in the mud. <laughs> And uh, and uh, mosquitoes you could put saddles on. Mm -hmm. It was a, a, a kind of a, a an interesting place to bivouac and to train for what our purpose was. We had been assigned out of as junior grade officers. You to, were a lieutenant at this time. Yes, mm -hmm. to fill the ranks of uh, uh, the 84th. Division, the Rail Splitters Division. Uh, Is this in the infantry? In the infantry. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was assigned to uh, an outfit called M Company of the 333rd Regiment of the 84th Division. And then I was involved in an accident there, became the last junior grade officer to leave. Uh, the 84th Division before they shipped over to be caught in in, in the bulge and to freeze to death. And I, out of uh, out of 62 of us that finished OCS and were assigned to the 84th, there were only 50. I mean, there were 54 that were either wounded, killed, or captured in the in the bulge. They in the fighting the well, bulge. Pretty well caught hell and. And uh, the man who was my, the first sergeant of my M company uh, was killed over there. And, and uh, you know, while he was acting as the battalion commander. I think uh, you told me that uh, as a result of that accident, you were sent back to the Kennedy's Veteran Hospital here in Memphis. That's right, they flew me up, my father intervened with uh, Cliff Davis he, when he found out the, it was a rather severe accident. What had happened was uh, we were trying to get a jeep out of a, a little dirt road and uh, there were 14 of us in the middle of the night down Camp Claiborne and, and uh, we all got out and were trying to push it back up on the, on the, the top of the turtle back. And, and, uh, Jeep had flipped over? Yeah, 
and uh, everybody else's foot slipped at the same time but mine, and the Jeep came back down on me, and that's how it uh, turned out to be something that obviously saved my, my life, or at least dramatically improved my odds of surviving World War II. How long were you here in Memphis at Kennedy? Long enough for my mama to call my my, my wife and, and sell her on the idea of marrying me. <laughs> uh, she proposed for me, for my, uh, and then uh, as quick as they could get me out, uh, they shipped me for limited service time to Camp Robinson, Arkansas, to train infantry recruits to go in. And we were all really being kind of held up, and I found out later the strategy of the thing was that, that we were the, to be the kind of cannon fodder for the uh, invasion of Japan. Invasion of Japan. Mm -hmm. And I doctored my uh, records a little bit and to get to go over because I thought I could win the war all by myself. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, <laughs> Uh, then as soon as they uh, dropped the bombs and everything, it was clear that, that uh, the war was already being won. Then I spent the rest of my time trying to get my record straight to show them that I couldn't do that. But anyway, I wound up, uh, before I got all that straight, I spent a year in, in the Army of Occupation in Japan. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Where were you physically when the bomb was dropped? Uh, I was uh, on uh, David. I'm not exactly sure at what what level I, I had left uh, Camp Robinson, Arkansas, and I was in transit some way or other uh, through Seattle. Uh, Washington and went around. We took the northern route over, but but when the, when the war ended, I was at sea. Mm -hmm. and, uh, How did you hear we, about the bomb, the dropping of the bomb? Do you recall? Oh, it, it came over the. Uh, now I, I, I could probably make some pretty good stories up about it, but I wouldn't want. <laughs> I would want to vouch for exactly where I, where I was. I know I, I was uh, elated to hear it because I didn't want to be part of what I had already been taught was going to be the, the problems connected with the invasion of that southern coast of Honshu, mm -hmm. that I was going to be, be called on to drop off the side of those ships and, and uh, wait to show I was just uh, now you had, suicidal. Yeah. You had not gone to law school when you went into the military, is that correct? That's correct. I was in pre-law. Okay. And I had, uh, had wanted to be a, a chemical uh, engineer, uh, and a, a color chemist, they call it. To, and it was a, a method of chemical analysis that differed from quantitative and qualitative and all of the things that you learn uh, there because uh, uh, it was light rays that you beamed at, uh, at the element that you wanted to identify. And uh, the way that the rainbow shaped up is what made the color. And I became fascinated with that because one of the people I trained under at Culver Military Academy had been the guy that put the uh, capsule together for the New York World Fair to tell everybody what, what science advancements had taken place at that, at that time. And it was to be uh, dug up 200 years from, from that World Fair date to tell the people that existed at that time how, how the old folks uh, lived at that 
generation in time scientifically. When you got out of the military, what rank were you, Lee? I came out as a captain. And, uh, uh, but being an infantry officer, and a heavy, heavy weapons uh, company at that, uh, background in, in uh, training, there wasn't much room for infantry officers in the Army of Occupation. And so we drew lots. And I, I lost, and I drew two companies, the 236 QM Salvage and the 566 uh, six, uh, QM Laundry Company, and uh, had one other junior grade officer that was in the same fix. He was supposed to have one of them, so we we teamed up and. And uh, then we flipped. And I lost again, and I became the, the commanding officer of, of both, and he became the executive officer of both. And we wound up with uh, 1,030 enlisted troops. We were both 23 years old, and we were the only two officers that they had left. They were letting everybody go home that had any, anything to do it. Lee, and, I and remember when we first started practicing law together that uh, you were telling me some of your war experiences. And cr if you would, tell me uh, about the, uh, uh, how, uh, what you observed when you got to Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Oh, well, we, we set up uh, supply dumps in both of those areas. Uh, we were in charge of, of furnishing uh, all quartermaster supplies to, to both the uh, Army of Occupation troops and to the Japanese who we were keeping from starving, or keeping some of them from starving. Now, is this after the bomb was dropped? Oh, was this was Army of Occupation, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, we had 27. Uh, supply dumps, but the uh, time you're talking about was when we were first going in, first moving into Japan. And uh, and, and we tried with our or ship's original instructions for the, uh, were to, to land and disembark at Nagasaki. And uh, we tried to do that. We went over on cargo nets and then waited on in. And uh, the uh, after effects of, of the bomb were just awe-inspiring. And you take that many military troops and nobody was saying a word. And that in and of itself was eerie. Uh, the, uh, uh, grass, uh, weeds, the stones on the fence. Uh, there was this long slope going up from the beach, and any time you take a step, uh, you just you'd make a uh, an imprint, just like walking through ashes and you couldn't feel anything. You could go over thinking you were going to uh, lean up against a, a stone fence and it, it just go right straight through like there was nothing there, like you were not touching anything. And once you take a bunch of GI infantry soldiers that are soaking wet from salt water wading and <laughs> start them up a hill like that, and everything became deadly silent. Mm. Just deadly silent. And uh, so the, the blast from that heat, or the heat from that blast, the was heat so from that blast, it just uh, eliminated everything. Just mm. eliminated everything. It was, it was uh, nobody. 
could say anything. There wasn't anything you could say. Finally, they came off the ship with a, with a horn and said, we're uh, happy to report we've gotten our uh, orders changed. Uh, we're re-embarking and uh, going to a, another uh, port of debarkation. And uh, we didn't have any trouble getting them to, to line back up to get their families back on board that ship. Mm. And we went to uh, an industrial city named Nagoya and marched in uh, inland from Nagoya and went to, uh, it's about 20 miles inland, to a uh, place that had been a, a, a factory, an uh, industrial area for the Japanese. And one of the things they did there was uh, make Suntory distillery and another, uh, make, make whiskey. And another thing they did was to make Betty Bombers. And uh, we... Uh, what we, are Betty Bombers? They, they were the Japanese uh, equivalent of our B-17s. And uh, we, we, uh, uh, we had some people, uh, some good old infantry boys, some of them from Tennessee that knew exactly what to do with that Suntory distillery. And we, got, <laughs> we got it going pretty good. <laughs> Did y'all have any resistance from the Japanese people when you came in? Any, any fighting or anything at all? Yes, one, one time. Uh, not too proud of it. Wasn't, any, uh, wasn't anything that you would uh, uh, <laughs> be looking for a silver star or, or, or even a lead star much, but uh, we, we went to set up the shop, these supply dumps, as I said. One of the places we had to operate was down at Kobe on the southern coastline. Uh, and a little camp up on a cherry tree mountain it was called Tarumi, which in Japanese means a boat of sweet repose. And uh, we were doing fine. And I was a pretty good marksman with everything but my assigned weapon. My assigned weapon was a 45 pistol and I could stand in the middle of this room and not hit a wall with a 45 pistol and yet I was an expert marksman and everything else but the, the uh, sergeant came and said Captain we're being attacked this is the middle of the so night you're he being was, attacked yeah he, we, we, he was on guard duty and uh, I said, uh, Sergeant, I told you to stay away from that damn Suntory distiller. Now, what, 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 what do you think you're doing? He said, no, sir. He said, I'm, I'm not kidding. So I got up, and we had taken the weapons away from all people and put them in, locked them up in storage. And, and, uh, so we reissued those in a hurry. Went through all of the half-baked uh, emergency drills and stuff that we fooled with. And, uh, and uh, formed what we in the infantry called a line of skirmishers and started to cross. Somebody shot, I don't know whether it was uh, one of the Japs so or one of our people, but anyway, it didn't take but one, one shot to start a barrage, and I, I guess we, I, I don't know how many bullets we expended or how much it cost the United States government that, that particular night, but uh, we uh, uh, finally wound up rounding up 
about 25 or 30 uh, uh, Japanese diehards who had uh, raided our camp for purposes of trying to get some food. The Japanese were all starving to death at the time. And uh, so we, we loaded them onto two and a half ton trucks and, and yeah. herded them on into to, uh, Kobe, turned them over to the military. But that was the only time I was ever really shot at. The rest of the time, I just got the opportunity to sleep in mud holes and, and uh, eat out of uh, garbage cans. Hmm. Lee, I want to uh, direct your attention back to uh, what happened after you got out of the military. Did you go back to school? Went back to school and in took Knoxville. A, in, in Knoxville, I had had a, a, a track scholarship to go to to uh, Knoxville, and uh, really was not good enough to have gotten the track scholarship. And uh, World War II saved me from that fact being disclosed <laughs> because on April the 7th, I was supposed to run my first <laughs> track meet for the University of Tennessee, and it would have been disgraceful. <laughs> and uh, we, we got on the train and went to, uh, to Chattanooga, the military camp the night before. So. But, uh, yeah. Well, you graduated at that time, or did you have to go back in undergraduate to finish your degree? I had to go back in undergraduate, but I, I took uh, uh, 24 hours uh, in, in one quarter to speed that up. I was married, and my wife was working my way through law school along with the GI Bill. and. and uh, she was uh, uh, quite anxious for me to to get get through as fast as I could. So uh, I had had an excellent incentive to to, to do just that, and and uh, I uh, took e either one and a half or two quarters per quarter till I got ready to go and. Into law school. To law school. Let me ask you this: Why didn't you become an engineer? I had that wife telling me that she didn't want to work all her life, <laughs> <laughs> and and there wasn't any great demand for for chemical engineers, and and uh, particularly those that make a living. And my father was, uh, of course, uh, practicing. And, and uh, that was an opportunity to get a job. And your brother Jim had already gone into practice with your dad at that no, time. No, no, Jim. Jim didn't. Jim didn't start practicing until much later. He uh, mentioned that he'd had uh, uh, quite a nerve-wracking uh, series of experiences in in the military. Okay. And. Uh, in, in the Air Force, and uh, and they prescribed uh, uh, quiet time and all, and but Jim Jim wanted to wanted to uh, practice and and he he got a job as uh, in the claims department of the Memphis Light Gas and Water Division first, and went to night law school. Okay. Well, and then he and Jim were near a uh, lawyer here in town who was his brother-in-law uh, opened up shop. And I had, of course, gone to work for Winchester and Uh Let me uh, ask you this. Uh, you mentioned about your wife. Uh, tell us about Bet. What was her maiden name? Her maiden name was Betty Ann Thompson. And uh, she, she was from Knoxville? A Knoxville, and she was a Sigma Chi sweetheart, and I was an SAE. And uh, so we had a kind of a unique uh, uh, relationship, but she was also made the 
the, the UT Beauty section in the paper. And, and, uh, How many children do y'all have? We have uh, three children. We have uh, uh, ten uh, birth grandchildren and two adopted grandchildren. And they're coming out of the woodwork like termites right now. I don't know exactly how many great-grandchildren. I think they're about eight or something like that. <laughs> Lee, tell us uh, about your children. Just give us their names and what they're doing now. Uh, my daughter, Robin, was the oldest. Uh, incidentally, Beth's uh, father was uh, Robin Thompson. And uh, that's where the Robin name came in. But uh, he was a photographer and uh, was the UT photographer and took all the, all the pictures and everything, uh, football and otherwise. And, and uh, one of his biggest uh, endeavors was that he uh, and another fellow on mule back uh, went into the Smokies and took all of the pictures to be submitted to the United States Congress to get Smoky Mountains National Park approved. Hmm. And so Robin's your oldest? And Robin is she, the oldest. She's married and where does she and, live? Uh, she's uh, married and her husband was the, the uh, uh, over in Chattanooga and he was a the Hamilton County engineer. He got, he finished uh, engineering school at UT, and uh, and then they had this job. And uh, this past year, he died of a heart attack uh, uh, jogging in the morning. He, and uh, so she's living over in Chattanooga. Uh, she's a, uh, a psychologist uh, by by education. But uh, she's raising, uh, have, they had four children of their own and, and through her, uh, her work and, and particularly through training and working with uh, underprivileged children one thing or another, uh, she found uh, what everybody had already given up as a hopeless situation and adopted two, two children. So she has six to, to uh, work with over in Chattanooga now. And who's your second oldest? The second oldest is uh, your law partner and mine. And uh, one of the smarter and you know, better lawyers in the state of Tennessee. <laughs> and, and I have some of his cards if anybody would, <laughs> would okay. like to. Uh, and then your third child. And then and, uh, he has a, a daughter who is a recent uh, uh, graduate, and she's, she's also practicing in the office. Uh, okay. Um, you mentioned about uh, grandchildren. Are any of your grandchildren grown yet in practicing law? You mentioned uh, yes. Robin. Robin is. is uh, She's an associate uh, in our uh, firm, is that yes, right? Yes, yes. Very bright young and, lady. And then, uh, well, I egotistically think so. And, and uh, she and her husband just recently had a little great granddaughter for us who's. Mm -hmm. Very, very precious child. You just no idea how beautiful she really is. Yeah. And then your third child was John. Is that John right? John Winchester. Mm -hmm. And uh, John uh, uh, manages. Uh, I guess you'd say he's in the real estate management uh, business for uh, keeping the, uh, people who own commercial property happy with their investment. He yeah. finds tenants for them and, and uh, uh, keeps things cleaned up. And, and, and if I uh, misunderstood you, I think you said that you have some cards that you would pass out about uh, young Rick's uh, 
uh, involvement in our firm. Uh, that's Richard L. Winchester. Is that that's correct, right. Junior? That's the Richard L. Winchester. And we call him affectionately Rick. Rick. Okay. We just want to get that straight. That's the distinction. Okay. Uh, Lee, um, uh, I know you had a lot of experiences in law school and probably could tell us a lot of stories, but uh, are there any particular stories or, or uh, professors that stick out in your mind? One, uh, David, I mentioned to you the other day, I believe, that you may be uh, <laughs> referring to. We had a... Uh, Just to make it clear for the record, you went to UT Law School, is that correct? Oh, yeah, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I went with uh, uh, an illustrious group. Uh, a large number of them have uh, even succeeded in becoming fellows of foundation and, and we uh, we had some interesting experiences uh, the one I mentioned to you was we had a prof named Judge Jones who was quite a colorful character retired judge and uh, Judge Jones was bald headed and he had a scar on his head which was uh, always red and his, his, his scalp was, was white. But whenever he would get upset or mad, they would reverse and the scar would turn white and his head would turn red. And uh, so he called under the textbook, uh, casebook educational system uh, on uh, a man and uh, Frank Crawford has passed away, and, and so I, uh, I hesitate to to tag the culprit as being Frank, but I'd swear that he was the one that uh, was involved. You know, once once you learn how to handle the casebook method, it's pretty easy to to make it through without really having done your homework. You you can pick out the the key points that you know you have to to go to to uh, get the point of the case to fit it into the program. Judge Jones had called on Frank. Frank stood up, and the way you handle that when you hadn't done your homework was you you took your your case notebook, put your textbook in inside that, and then you picked the key points to to recite your case. Frank was going great guns with that system and fulfilling his obligations. And about that time, Judge Jones wrapped up on his desk with violent slap and says, Mr. Crawford, you know that's not the law on that subject. Where did you get that garbage? Frank looks back at his book. <laughs> and, and, uh, well, Your Honor, to tell you the truth, uh, I got it right out of the book. <laughs> so what book? Says, Our textbook, Your Honor. Bring it forward. Well, he, he brought it up there. Judge looked at it, and the scar turned white, and the scalp turned red. And we didn't have a lot of money in textbooks. You passed on and made a little money when you were selling. This was on toward the end. But it, <laughs> that didn't bother Judge Jones. He grabbed, uh, grabbed that textbook. And he came out with uh, with that whole case, and does this with it, balls it up in a little ball, and says, Mr. Crawford, you are excused to take this to the men's room and dispose of it uh, by placing it where it properly belongs. <laughs> and and uh, so that uh, emphasized the fact that that uh, that really wasn't the, 
the law on that particular subject. At least it wasn't for the remainder of that, of that uh, particular class in school. I'm going to ask you. We one. had a lot of things happen in law school like that. We were the, the either the last or the next to the last graduating class from uh, Old Hensley. Okay. I think it'd be a good time for us to take a break right now. Fine, man. Appreciate that. <laughs> Lee, uh, we concluded our break uh, about talking uh, about your law school experience. I'd like to kind of move into the next era uh, right after you graduated from law school. Uh, what year did you graduate from law school, by the way? I finished in uh, 49. Uh, and where did you go June after that? June of 49, but I got my license uh, the semester before. Uh, graduation, you, which you could do at that at that time. Did you have to take a bar exam? Took the bar and everything, and but as a result of that, I was able to be on uh, the first uh, uh, legal aid clinic experiment at the university. I mean, we uh, I got to get to try make, some make cases. a few. Uh, mm -hmm. How general sessions court uh, appearances uh, in Knox County before I came, before I transferred to Shelby County to practice law. But yeah, it. Uh, uh, and who did you go to work for? I, obviously, my father didn't even didn't even seek uh, employment. Uh, as a little sequel to that, a few years. After that, when after uh, what now? A few years after I had started practicing, right, and everything, and was here, uh, I was uh, extended an opportunity to uh, join another firm, but I uh, determined that I just wasn't in the cards. I couldn't leave my daddy by that time. How many lawyers did your dad have in the firm at that time? Daddy and Leo Beerman were practicing it together at that time, and uh, they were primarily engaged in the insurance defense practice. They had started that largely because insurance companies were the only ones that could pay cash fees. I remember my father back in the early days when I was a little boy going down to the bus stop to meet him or the streetcar stop and uh, having him get, get off the streetcar with live chickens or mm -hmm. other kind of produce uh, that he had uh, received for that day, day's work in, in lieu of cash. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, things were not too, too sporty at that time. And uh, uh, that was as a little boy, I, we didn't, I didn't, didn't ever, Get a live chicken for me. I got a, got a lot of raspberries for some of my work, maybe, but, <laughs> but not. <laughs> Did, didn't uh, didn't get into the chicken. How much did business. your dad pay you when you first started? Well, uh, the way the salary worked uh, was, I'm sure it was worked out with all due respect to. Uh, uh, Leo Beerman. I'm sure Leo had worked out the salary schedule and uh, that daddy actually wanted it that way because he he felt some guilt and and all the my running buddies in law school were out looking for for jobs and everybody thought I had a silver spoon in my mouth with a father already already practicing but they said, the setup was that I got two hundred and fifty dollars a month, and I think that was probably predicated on uh, what was going to be the minimum it was going to take to let me uh, get a streetcar fare to get to work. <laughs> uh, but in any event, 
uh, for that, I had 30 files per day. I mentioned the insurance practice and didn't have all of the claims adjusting companies that they have now. The lawyers usually did the claim adjusting and uh, for the lawyers, for the carriers. And it might best be identifying a motor number off of a car or something. But I had 35, I mean 30 files to report to Leo's secretary on on my desk each each day. And I learned a lot of shortcuts to be able to find out what had happened in city court and uh, evaluate those things to give reports to the insurance carrier on our liability and things of that sort. And and uh, and was on that, that was for free. That was for the, for the guarantee of the 250. Then 100% of what I made on my own up to the 250 went back to the firm. Then after that, my chance for any additional compensation was that I got 50% of anything I could establish as having been generated on my own. And uh, the other 50 went, went to the firm. How would a young lawyer during those days uh, generate business on your own? Well, uh, the ethics of the profession were, were such that you really kind of had to plot and scheme around uh, that. And uh, one of the things that I found most productive was that I'd go down to the liquor store and buy a half pint of whiskey, and I was quite active in the uh, American Legion, the VFW. All, uh, all of us uh, as returning veterans, I'd go down to the Legion post and, and uh, get out the half pint of whiskey and put it up on the table and. Uh, pour, pour a drink and, and uh, uh, sit there and that was amazing how many, uh, how many veterans that would attract over to, to my table and I'd start telling uh, what I would hope would turn out to be witty uh, lawyer stories so that they would all ask me if I was a lawyer and I'd identify myself as one and and invariably they'd have a, a friend. I, I have a friend, say I have a friend that ha, has a, uh, a problem. And what is it? Well, this would enable me to screen their, quote, friend's problem. And uh, if, if it looked like they really did have a, a problem that had a potential of a fee in it, I would, in, invite them to come on up to the, to the office and not waste all the time uh, doing that. And, and with that plus knowing most everybody in Shelby County having grown up here and bounced around uh, all my life, I was able to, to build up a, a decent practice, uh, pretty, pretty fast, even though the time that I had to build on my own was generally from anything after after 8 p.m. at night and before 8 a.m. in the morning. The rest of the time, just take my word for it, Leo Beeman saw to it that I was a pretty busy young lad. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got, uh, 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 further indoctrination in that regard when I got a part-time job, the last I was the last part-time Shelby County attorney and uh, got $10,000 a year for holding that job. I held that from 59 to 63. But you were the actual county attorney at that time, is yes. that right? Yes, But, but they the only paid you for part-time. The last part-time, right. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
and they, uh, uh, but Charlie Baker was quite a frugal person. And uh, Charlie Baker was the uh, chairman of the county commission at that time? He was the chairman of the county court then. County court. It, it was the same as the county commission now. Well, uh, and, and the, uh, we didn't have uh, assistance, so we just had the county attorney. And uh, that was a pretty rough uh, uh, deal to try to represent all of the different uh, groups that, uh, that needed legal services connected with county government. That was it. But I got Charlie to let me hire two part-time assistants finally, right before I finally told them I had to quit. And, uh, that was after. Lee, uh, when we were talking about young lawyers uh, starting salaries, uh, uh, it may have been a while since you uh, hired a, a young lawyer, but uh, uh, do you, how would you say the way that you came on board uh, sets up with the way that uh, young lawyers are hired today, based on your knowledge. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, I think I mentioned to you one time that Daddy, my father, uh, didn't have a, a college uh, legal education until after he'd already gotten his license to practice. He. He paid Colonel Walter Canada $50 a month for the right to study under, under him. So he had to pay to work for somebody else. He paid 50 a month. And then and he got his license and started practicing in the daytime and, and got a job clerking the grocery store at night uh, to support the family. And, uh, but, uh, then he reached the conclusion that he didn't have a, enough legal education to uh, to make uh, uh, make it right for the client, and with that, and so he he dropped out and and uh, went to Cumberland for a year and got his uh, law degree from Cumberland University I guess after he was already a licensed practitioner. Yeah. And uh, I guess what you're saying then is that the fee schedule that you came up with, you think that that's being used still today, most lawyers? <laughs> no, I don't think you can. Uh, Not for the 250, but I'm talking about the percent of what you bring in. And No, no, I don't think uh, that, uh, and I, I don't think even at that time that I was, frankly, I don't think I was getting a fair break. I think I was paying rather dearly for for your education for my education that I was getting mm -hmm. and I would almost compare that to uh, Colonel Canada's treatment of my father mm -hmm. I, you know it, listening to you and uh, and I should have asked you about this earlier I noticed that uh, because you talked about how how tough it was uh, when you first started and, and uh, you also talked about your toughness and, uh, as a track runner and uh, at, uh, as a powder puff person. <laughs> uh, I noticed that uh, you have an oxygen uh, assistance here today. Uh, if you would, uh, explain what's going on with your health and, and how tough it's been for you over the last couple of years. Well, it's been pretty tough on you and the other members of the firm too, David, and I'm deeply appreciative of the, of the fact I uh, uh, developed cancer, uh, both uh, uh, bone, uh, lung, and uh, spleen and colon, and uh, all at uh, pretty much at the same time. I've had a total of uh, uh, 39 cancer treatments in the last two years. Wow. Been in intensive care four times, and it's been uh, been pretty tough, and for that I want to 
uh, apologize to those members of the foundation that are having to listen to an old raspy <laughs> voice coming from a senile old goat. My main claim to fame, uh, I guess, being that uh, uh, old age, that I've gotten old enough to where I can uh, reminisce about a bunch of old yarns, and there's nobody around still living that can call me a liar about it. So, well, uh, I want to ask you about some of that old history here next, and that uh, has to do getting back to your days as a young lawyer. Uh, what was the political atmosphere in Memphis when you first came into practice? And I'm speaking specifically about the Crump uh, boss era. Crump and uh, the Crump administration. It was who pretty much totally under the under the control of uh, uh, Mr. E.H. Crump, who was uh, had come up here from Holly Springs, I believe it was Mississippi. But in any event. Uh, uh, Things were pretty tough down on the riverfront in, in Memphis at that particular time in history. And Crump became the secretary of a good government league once that included just about everybody that was anybody in Memphis that had uh, assembled together to clean up the town. And uh, Crump utilized uh, that opportunity served as secretary of that group, originally called meetings and fought political uh, battles with uh, everything at their disposal, just about. And uh, but did a good job, and more and more people would just, since he was doing a good job, they let him do it, and he. He, in my opinion at least, uh, did a great deal for Memphis, uh, but he was known as, as Boss Crump. I was, uh, and he was. He, he ran the political show when I first came to Memphis to practice, but uh, that was fading. He was aging like we all do, and, and uh, did you ever have occasion to work with I, him or Daddy for and him? Leo uh, represented the insurance carriers that uh, through whom Mr. Crump had written most of his in, uh, insurance uh, business. And uh, so uh, whenever Mr. Crump uh, needed any, anybody to do some kind of a thankless political job, I would frequently get the call because uh, Mr. Crump's uh, Lady Friday was a, a, a lady named Ms. Humphreys who was a very smart, capable woman. But anyway, for some reason or other, I was able to hornswoggle her into thinking that I was a cute little boy or something. And, and uh, she, uh, would always let me get through to kind of find out what was going on and and everything and help me greatly. And that probably helped you in, with influence yeah. with a lot, a lot of people. It was a, I, confident I was getting it from somewhere other than from my own personal qualifications. And that <laughs> might well be it. But in any event, uh, uh, you paid for those things. Uh, uh, Mr. Crump uh, called my daddy and congratulated him on the fact that I'd been uh, given the opportunity to move up in the ladder in the American Legion, that, that he, he needed somebody to, to uh, uh, work that was friends with the administration. And so, uh, I, through my diligent effort and a little bit on Mr. Crump's part, I was able to become the commander of the largest American Legion post in the United States. Really? And, uh, and then 
uh, Perry Pipkin, who headed up A.E. Pipkin and Sons Insurance Agency. Mr. Crump, incidentally, was, was an insurance right. man. Uh, uh, we had all the companies that A.E. Pipkin and Son wrote their insurance through. And uh, so Perry called Daddy and congratulated him on the fact that I was going to get active in the Mid-South Fire Association, which was Perry's thing. So. Uh, I, I so got you became active, president of that I, too. <laughs> I got got active in that. So, yeah, it was a two-headed street. One of the things that I might mention here, if uh, I hope George Thomas may still be in Dresden and not uh, not come into this particular foundation meeting, because I wouldn't want him to challenge all of the accuracy of it, but it's pretty, pretty close. George and I were very good friends. George was from Greensfield, uh, Greenfield, uh, Dresden, uh, up, uh, Martin, up in that bailiwick, where uh, the man that was running against Estes Kefauver for the United States Senate, uh, was the chancellor, and so George was wired in to to work for Dr. for Judge Mitchell, and uh, and uh, Ms. Humphreys had told uh, me that I was to take a precinct over in Knoxville. This this election was out last year up there in school, so George had some similar instructions from some unknown. So and so we were uh, assigned by the Knox County uh, Mitchell for Senate delegation to a precinct that was a large labor precinct. Estes Keithhoff had all of the labor vote. We were over there passing out cards and thought we were doing a pretty good job. And uh, we heard a little conversation going over in the corner, and one of the men was talking to the other one, and they were having kind of an argument. He says, "Well, by God, we got to give them one vote." And, and they were having some debate about that. But in any event, who was we, he referring to when he said we got to give them one vote? Uh, we were we were passing out cards uh, for. Uh, Judge Mitchell, Mitchell mm -hmm. uh, in the race against Estes Kefauver, when the the year that Mr. Kefauver first uh, beat Mr. Crump for uh, political office, and uh, and we, uh, when the vote was all over and everything, Judge Mitchell only had one vote in in our precinct, and and. George swore he had voted for Mitchell, and I swore I had. And even though George and I have been close friends all our lives, I hadn't trusted him since. Because <laughs> you knew <laughs> that I you knew I'd for voted. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I'd voted for, for Mr. Mitchell. And now I, I, I can't vouch for George. I don't know what happened to all those votes up there. So the, they had one vote between the two of you that they were going to get to Mitchell. They had one vote, and they gave it to us. Yeah. Uh, we uh, had another little key fall for deal. This one involved Al Gore Sr. Uh, we got an opportunity to stay in Al Gore Sr.'s apartment in Washington uh, when the National American Legion Convention was held there. And Gore was supposed to be out of town, but something happened and he came back in town and stayed in his own room and and uh, the phone rang and, and uh, we heard him answer it and and that's the way we knew he was uh, he was back and it, it calmed us down dramatically but in any event 
turned out the next day, he told us that uh, that uh, this phone call was from some unknown uh, racist uh, character that was uh, obviously partially intoxicated and, and everything, but called to to give Mr. Gore hell for what he considered to be uh, the wrong side of the uh, integration dash segregation uh, battle that we all went through those times. And uh, the senator said he got just tired of listening and and uh, it happened every now and then when somebody could slip through and get the number. And, and he just put the phone over on his pillow, went on to sleep, woke up sometime later, and this guy was still ranting and raving on the, on the telephone. He said he just... Making racial comments? Yeah, mm. yeah, just every way he could. And, uh, uh, Senator Gore said, uh, I wanted to try to just go and hang up the phone because I, I knew I was going to have to hang up the phone sometime or other. And this guy was not going to ever quit. So I said, Sir, can I butt in just a minute and ask you a question? Yeah, this is you? No. Oh, oh Gore, Gore is, is, is telling uh, 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 me and everybody all was other, in the room. Yeah. Uh, by way of preamble, uh, Quint Lafon uh, was a, uh, uh, married Ken by Ken by marriage to Albert, and it was through that connection. It was a whole bunch of us uh, that uh, were there at Gore's apartment. He said, uh, I said, I being Albert, said, sir, let me ask you a question. Suppose that you would desire to die and go to heaven and you got to the gate and St. Peter turned out to be a black man. What would you do? He said there was this obvious drunken pause on the other end of the of the line and then this guy blurts out says I'd just turn around and go back to hell with you and ask this key off <laughs> so uh, we had some interesting uh, uh, public times getting back to your uh, early career in your law practice, uh, you said you did a lot of defense work. Are there any cases that come to mind that you were involved in that uh, kind of stand out uh, in your memory? Well, some of the, uh, I won a few that I should have lost and I lost a few that I think I should have won. Uh, I remember you telling me about the Southern Railway case. Was that uh, pretty? That was an interesting one. I'm kind of proud of that. I uh, represented the city of Germantown, or at least a bunch of citizens there. And uh, how big was Germantown at this time? 856 people. But we uh, uh, fought the Southern Railroad to. Uh, a decision that the Southern Railroad had to make to to move out the switchyards to Collierville instead of uh, Germantown, and I think to that extent played a rather vital role in the uh, the direction that uh, that Germantown took, in so far as being a bedroom community. Right. I. Uh, you were one of the early residents of Germantown, is that right? I was the early resident, and, uh, and uh, I got, uh, I won a, a liquor store case for uh, Germantown, in which 
uh, they, particularly my, my friend, uh, then who was the Baptist minister, thought it was just a great victory. It was really a slam dunk because I had all of them all on my side. But uh, I, uh, I won, won that and then subsequently uh, got involved in, and uh, won the other side and got a license for Elio, Elio Lenati. How long were you city attorney for the city of Germantown? Uh, all the way from the time we moved out there in 1956 until, oh gosh, I guess, it was all the way up until the time they started paying fees for serving. <laughs> that's, that, that's when I ran into some competition. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, I but, but read I, that I, you I were a city all. attorney out there from 1966 to 1981. Does that sound that, about right? That's about right. Yeah. And you were also a city, I was city attorney at one time or another for every. Uh, uh, satellite city in Shelby County. Hmm. Collierville, I, I lost the Collierville business because Germantown, I was serving as city attorney for both, and Germantown enacted an ordinance of uh, 30 miles per hour speed limit for automobiles and 10 miles an hour for horses and started enforcing the, the, the horse portion of the ordinance on Collierville residents. I got a call from my, my friend, the mayor out at Collierville, that told me the kitchen heat was getting a little tough. He was going to have to <laughs> give that city attorney's job to a Collierville resident or else get me to drop that, to make uh, Germantown drop that uh, horse, horse provision. Orders. Horse provision of the ordinance. That's right. But I, I, uh, I also I drew the first uh, industrial development board uh, charter for in Shelby, Shelby County. County. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I read that was, also that, that you was were fought rather vigorously by some leading uh, uh, developers in. Shelby County, who came in and appeared uh, to resist the thing, and Charlie Baker had, had me draw it up on a crash program as being uh, essential that we get rolling and everything in a hurry. And uh, what was the purpose of the Industrial Development Board uh, to, le legislation? Uh, provide the financing, the bond financing. And this opened the door for me to be able to to uh, learn the bond work, and I got involved in and in, got approved in the, in the bond, bond, bond buyer and being bond counsel for people, and had several appearances before the Securities Exchange Commission and that kind of stuff. I've. Uh, yeah, you also became you were Shelby County attorney for quite some period of time. But I notice here that you were also Shelby County School Board Attorney. Is that right? That's correct. From I, 1960 to 2007? That's correct. Wow. Um, I went through uh, seven school superintendents. Now, w tell me about your involvement in the, uh, uh, the uh, desegregation case here uh, for the school I, board. I handled it from its inception until uh, 2000 and, until I had my st stroke, mm -hmm. I mean my cancer. And is that case still going on? Yeah. And how many years has that been? Forty. Well, it's 60, it was filed in 64. Mm -hmm. And uh, 44 years. It was actually filed, but it had already started a couple of years before that. Mm -hmm. And uh, but it just actually got filed in in '64. Yeah. Do you ever see an end coming to that case? Well, we have. You're supposed to be able to get it dismissed when you 
unified and, uh, uh, and uh, unitary zone, just one school system, and and we think that it's you know, long since ready for dismissal. We hadn't really had any any heavy controversial matters except to right and right now it's it's the the efforts to stop it to, to get a dismissal are still going on. If I recall something recently that uh, both sides on that litigation had approached the judge to dismiss it and the court right. took it upon itself not to that's, dismiss. That's correct and it's still pending. Okay. Um, getting back to your uh, uh, terms as a municipal attorney, uh, what is it that you liked about representing these small towns? Uh, it's, I think they're uh, collectively probably comprise some of the most grateful clients. Uh, and, and frequently for some of the most unique reasons. It, it, it just it's it's right. Just it's it's just kind of fun to to uh, see uh, politics at that level at work and and uh, to see uh, and get a, get a feel for of appreciation for for what really goes on in America and what makes it tick. Also. Uh you told me earlier too that as uh, the Shelby County attorney that you were involved in the Baker v. Carr uh, case. Had Came involvement in that. I drew the uh, Industrial Development Board charter mm -hmm. and I, I was just starting to mention that, that, uh, that I drew it on a crash uh, program and it was stayed a crash program until a uh, couple of the leading commercial development citizens in town uh, found out about it. And uh, they wheeled in uh, books on those uh, warranty deed go-karts down that come out of the basement of the, of the courthouse. Let, let me, uh, for the record, let's put their names out there because I think people would appreciate this story a little bit better if they knew who those were. Well, it was Mr. Boyle and Mr. Mr. Bell. Mr. Boyle. Uh, Boyle Investment Company. Boyle Investment Company, and one Belt. of the largest developers in Shelby County, and uh, Philip Belts. Philip Belt. And, uh, They're very famous they, developers they here not, in town. They were not uh, not known generally for getting along too well, but they seemed pretty friendly that day. They, uh, they uh, wheeled, wheeled in the day that I had the, the bill already. It was getting ready to be voted on, right? Getting ready to be uh, voted on. And, and uh, Mr. Phil, I believe it was, it was two of them, said, uh, gentlemen of court, we, we're here to oppose this item because we think that you all are trying to compete for uh, the, the rental of commercial space and giving unfair incentives to, to people uh, that would otherwise potentially be our customers. And we take an extremely dim view of uh, 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 making that form of contribution to our uh, the competitors. So we, we dug it up and have here with us on these go-karts the records to reflect that we pay 3% of the taxes in, in uh, Shelby County, Tennessee, and that uh, to the extent of our ability, uh, we're going to vote for the political demise of anybody that votes in favor of this legislation. And, and hell, I sat there and we couldn't we couldn't get a, a a motion to bring it to the table, <laughs> and I'd worked for two night and day for two weeks getting the thing all ready. 
Did they ultimately change their minds on that? Oh, about, oh yeah, about four or five years later, they realized that they, they needed that arm and tool uh, to, uh, to help compete in the, in the marketplace for the, for the business. And uh, they were very strong and very fine, have done a great job for and Shelby County, but that's just one of the, they, they let it be known that they, when they, when they were called on, they would, they would uh, demonstrate there. Uh, Lee, uh, you've had such a varied career uh, in the legal profession, and as we've seen, uh, it goes all the way from representing small communities to uh, Shelby County and Supreme Court decisions like Baker v. Carr. Um, I want to uh, ask you about this. Were you ever able, or did you ever serve as in the judiciary at all uh, at any particular level? I have served at one time or another on uh, every uh, state and local civil bench in Tennessee. Really? At one time or another, Even including, including the Supreme including Court? Including the State Supreme Court. This is the State Supreme Court of Tennessee. Right. Tell us about that and how uh, that came well, about. Usually it would be uh, helping uh, uh, a guy who would be a buddy of mine who also happened to be a, a judge and when his vacation would come along he'd look for somebody he needed to, to cover his courtroom while he was on vacation and I, I was uh, I did that uh, for most of it but uh, the Supreme Court came about because uh, the Supreme Court itself got sued on an election. Uh, All the members of that existing Supreme uh, Court yeah. got sued? Got sued. And, and by who? Re by uh, uh, a, a person who uh, claimed to be a li uh, legally qualified candidate and had, had met the legal requirements to be qualified to be on the ballot. And had been denied by the that opportunity by the election commission, so he couldn't couldn't run, and he brought suit. The uh, all the members of the Supreme Court recused themselves, and uh, 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 Blanton was the governor at the time, and he appointed nine. Uh, special justices, three from each grand division, to serve as a special judge to hear the case, and, and uh, we we sat and deliberated on it. And, and uh, I guess if you listen to the other side, you'd you'd say, "Well, guess how that came out." <laughs> but in any event, we. We think that uh, that we gave it due deliberation, and and the Supreme Court justices won the, <laughs> won the case. Um, that uh, that's how that happened to go on the thing. But I've I've always felt, David, that that the change of the advertising rules uh, in connection with the solicitation of law business is the greatest tragedy that's occurred in, in the state as far as the practice of law, practice of law is concerned because uh, the, the way you got your business, the way you could make money uh, practicing law and, and feel good about it was uh, to get involved in civic affairs and to uh, do any and everything you could, whether it was in uh, political uh, arena or uh, civic club, whatever. Uh, that That's the way to get known. 
and uh, to make your mark, and and then have have clients that you've given a conscientious break, whether you won or lost for them, yeah. will be glad to tell that some some clients you get they just can can hardly wait to tell who they had as a lawyer. Oh. And uh and that, that's that's the way you get your business. I've never seen any business that came down the pike that that I thought somebody got through paid advertising that I thought that I would have been thrilled to to have uh gotten the case. Lee, when I first met you and came into the practice with you uh, back in, I think it was around 1970s, uh, the thing that everybody understood about Lee Winchester was that he was not only a, a, a fine lawyer, uh, but that he was a pretty astute business lawyer and a businessman. And I want to ask you a little bit about that. And and some of the is the mother of invention. <laughs> Why do you why do you say that? <laughs> <laughs> Had to do that to eat regularly. These, these kids uh, uh, coming along and, and have to be educated and everything else. You uh, 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 you, you see opportunities. And that's another benefit. It's it's a great benefit from the practice of law if you do it the way I'm. I'm saying that you do the, that you get your business that way. Mm -hmm. You get other opportunities, and uh, I, uh, I I'm involved in in uh, uh, we we jokingly uh, I, I built uh, condominiums down in in Florida. I, I think you've I, I also got involved in a in a. a you thought it was kind of funny when I told you that I got involved in a, a suntan oil <laughs> uh, business down in Florida. Yeah. I got I participated in in forming uh, quality concrete products here at a time when uh, all of my clients uh, owed money to Choctaw Culvert, which was the concrete pipe supplier in town, and they didn't want to get tagged as having been a part of forming quality concrete, so I had to go rent motel rooms uh, to hold meetings and send word out where where the next uh, stockholders meeting quality concrete was going to be held. <laughs> and I was quality concrete products as far as Choctaw was concerned for about almost the first year of its existence. But, uh, well, one part I want to ask you about, and, and, and I think one of the things that you're more well known for is starting one of the first de novo banks in, uh, in Germantown, Tennessee, back in the 70s, wasn't it? Yeah, I was about 20 years there. I was chairman of the board, one of the, one of the founding directors of of uh, Bank of Germantown, subsequently merged to uh, First First Tennessee. Tennessee, and uh, and, how did... uh, and that uh, was uh, very interesting and and uh, turned out lucrative uh, uh, for me and everything. I was I also. Uh, it set the tone for for a lot of other people we to one of the early, start community banks. I guess one of the one of the, the no, there was one out in uh, Collierville. Uh, we were head of the head of the Bird Boys on the Michael Bartlett, and uh, and uh, I guess we were first or second uh, community bank. There were only three. We learned how to compete with them uh, <laughs> uh, because I didn't have sense enough or know enough about the banking business to know really what you could and what you couldn't do. Mm -hmm. And I didn't see any reason why we could close up on Saturdays when half of our customers were, uh, couldn't get off any other time. Mm -hmm. I had one 
occasion uh, to be a director, you had to had to donate time. I mean, we had uh, apples as a uh, uh, deal, and that's your logo. That's our logo, and we <laughs> we had uh, you donated your time on Saturday morning to stand out there as a director and hand a customer an apple and say, my name's Lee Winchester. I'm board chairman of the Bank of Germantown and uh, just want to thank you for coming out and doing business with us and here give you an apple in appreciation. And uh, I did that one time, guy looked me in the eye. He says, I'm G.D. Glad. Somebody's thankful to see me out here because they told me yesterday to come out here today and and cover my overdrafts <laughs> and and close my account or go to jail. <laughs> and I kind of looked around, didn't know exactly what to say, and thought a minute, and I said, finally I said, sir, I just want to let you know we sure appreciate you taking our advice. <laughs> so that's, you, you have to kind of handle things the way they come down the pike and deal with what you're granted. You mentioned about the uh, condominium that you developed uh, with a partner, I think, in Silver Dunes in Destin, yes. Florida. Is that right? That's correct. What year was that, Lee? That was in 72 and 73. We, we built uh, uh, 102 units. We built half of them in 72 and half in 73. We sold over half of the units to Memphians. I think you mentioned to me that, that uh, you had an interesting experience with uh, being involved in uh, uh, ghosting the first uh, Horizontal Property Regiment Act in Florida. Horizontal Properties Act, yeah. Mm -hmm. That came about uh, as a result of this Silver Dunes, uh, this, this condominium business I got involved in. Uh, Tell us about how that happened. Well, we thought we had everything lined up. And uh, got a call from the lending institution. Just before you started construction, right? Yeah. And said, we got bad news. Uh, we found out that Florida has not yet passed its Horizontal Properties Act. There's one in Nevada and one in California. But Florida's hadn't passed yet, and we can't, we can't lend you the money. And I said, well, we're not ready to accept that. If we get that passed, will you still lend us some money? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'd love to. Uh, so I called my friend Ed Ray McWhorter. And Ed at that time was speaker here in Tennessee. And asked Ed if he uh, knew anybody in Florida that might help. Told him my problem. He said, I'm a dear friend of uh, the Speaker of the Florida House, and uh, let me call him and call you back. So the guy, uh, Ned called me back that same day and said, uh, Lee, he said, I don't know that there's anything we can do. He said, but uh, uh, everything that's passed by the Florida legislature has to go through the Florida Attorney General's office. And uh, they, they won't put on their agenda anything that hasn't. And I said, well, one more thing to do for me, Ned, if, if, if we figure out a way where we can get that thing put together, and if, if the Florida Attorney General's office could review our handiwork, you, you think that might suffice. He called back about 30 minutes later and said, man, the, my buddy down there said he'd love nothing better. And the Attorney General felt the same way, that they were overloaded. If they can get any help, they'll take it from wherever they can get it, even you included. <laughs> so he, uh, we, we got on the stick and we drew the Horizontal Properties Act kind of 
plagiarizing from Nevada and California and uh, got the thing down there to the Florida Attorney General. He approved it. And from the time Florida had even heard of that law until it was effective law in the state of Florida was less than 30 days. And we got that, we got a multi-million dollar project approved and, and uh, got it rolling. Uh, Lee, I just have one more question I want to ask you. Uh, in thinking back over your fast Incidentally, career. Incidentally, everybody that bought one of those things made money off of it. <laughs> I just want to ask you one final question, and given your vast experience that you've talked about here today, what accomplishment has given you the most satisfaction, would you say? Uh, you asked me that in general conversation uh, the other day, and I, I told you then, and I, I think it's still my uh, opinion, is that to the best of my knowledge, uh, I've had lots and lots of people agree with me and a lot of people disagree with me. I've fought some popular battles and I've fought some unpopular battles. But I have looked back over 50 or 60 years worth of law practice, and I can honestly look anybody in the eye and say, I don't believe that I've ever uh, had anybody accuse me of having knowingly allowed a, a lie or a deliberate misrepresentation to be made in or about any any case in which I've ever been involved. And that uh, if I can keep uh, my integrity uh, to that level uh, when I'm gone and have people say, well, there was a, he, he may have been a dumb SOB, but at least he shot straight. <laughs>